All right. We're going to call the meeting to order. Ms. Wolf, call. Yes. Allison Gould. Here. Tom Duster. Here. Scott Holwick. Here. Roger Lang. Here. Ken Hewson. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. He's not here. Jason Elkins. Here. Uh, Hope Bartlett. Here. And um, Heather McIntyre is here. And we have Council Member Martin with us here and guest. Scott Greenwing with the St. Brandon Left Hand Water Conservancy District. Here and we have John as a visiting guest. So, all right. Okay, very good. Uh, next, approval of previous month's minutes. Are there any questions or comments about last month's meeting or the minutes thereof? Mr. Chair, I would move to approve last month's meeting minutes. I would second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Very good. Water status report. Is that you, Wes? I'll have that. The flow of the St. Moraine at Lyons today was 17 CFS with a 125 year historic average of 22 CFS. Call the St. Moraine Creek is Pleasant Valley Reservoir. Admin 7,822 with a priority date of June 1st, 1871. Call the main stem of the South Platte River is Riverside Canal. Admin number 21031 with a priority date of August 1st, 1907. Uh, Ralph Price Reservoir at Button Rock uh, is at an elevation of 6,398.86 feet or 15,946 acre feet. So we're down approximately 250 acre feet. Union Reservoir is at an elevation of 26.1 feet or 11,387 acre feet, down approximately 1,300 acre feet. Or, uh, and that reservoir is releasing uh, five and a half CFS. On November 1st, the St. Brain Creek Basin storage was at 68%. And I think that's all I have for the uh, water status report. Any comments? Awesome. How low is that in comparison for Button Rock? How low is Button Rock? Yeah, in, in comparison with like yeah, the years. So it's actually probably pretty pretty high compared oh, yes. to the five year average. Um, but on if you looked at a longer term average, like maybe a forty year average, it's pretty close. Um, the goal is always to not have to start releasing until November first. And so we're releasing, we're passing the river plus releasing out of storage whatever the water treatment plant needs. Mm -hmm. And our winter demands have stayed pretty consistent for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we're, that's exactly where we wanted to be, full on November 1st and starting to spill, or starting to release out of storage. Remind me what the bypass is. Um, so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Oh, the, the that we're required to bypass. Well, I think what you're asking is, so we have to pass the river, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and whatever our accounting tells us the demand that the plant is taking, mm -hmm. that is the amount we have to take out of storage. So in other words, I think we've got, if I, so if I, in other words, we've got uh, 17 CFS going out, um, about 12 CFS is coming in, mm -hmm. and about five CFS is going out of storage. So. I guess another way would be saying we're, we're kind of bypassing the inflows of 12 CFS. Gotcha. And it's 17 coming out. 17 coming out of, out of the reservoir. Yes. Which is the same 17 as the first name Lyons? It is the. Roughly the same? So, the, but the, at Lyons, you have the con contribution of the South St. Brain. And it okay. just so happens the South St. Brain is probably yielding about 5 CFS. So, it just happens to be that the. The five CFS that the South is doing is equivalent to what the water treatment plants are taking. So even though we're taking more water at Longmont Reservoir, what the plants don't use, it returns back to the St. Rain Creek and it joins back up with the South St. Rain before it gets recorded in Lyons. So it's 
somewhat coincidental to okay. what were those two numbers. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, CWCB in Springfield is in CFS. Right, so that's all the way. That's pretty junior, but yeah. <clears throat> we, yeah, the low button. Anybody else? Thanks, Wes. Okay, public advisory heard. Uh, <coughs> Scott? Yes. How do I pronounce your name? Grimley. Grimley. Okay. Jesus. I think you are on, right? Yes, thank you very much. I've got a presentation that can pull up here. I'm going to be talking to you today about the St. Brandon Lifetime Water Conservancy District's pilot weather modification program. So thank you very much for having me. I'm a water resource engineer over the district. Just been been there about a year and a half, a little bit over that. Let's see here. I'll be going through some high-level physics of cloud seeding and weather modification. I'll be using the term cloud seeding and weather modification fairly interchangeably. Uh, talk about how the program optically operates, go over some common questions that folks have. Uh, highlight some of the other programs in Colorado and then focus in on our program at the district. Do you mind switching that to speaker view so that you sure. can see more of the yes. aware of the right here view? Oh, uh, it's the little uh, one yeah. screen to the left over here. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> Sorry. If you click on that part right That there. one, thank yeah. you. <laughs> it's a very sensitive oh, There we go. And I'll move this. You guys saw it a little bit, so you don't have yeah, to see right. it the rest of the time. <laughs> so, uh, let's see if I can go back one. This is what we all learned in kindergarten, probably. Um, snow comes from frozen water in clouds. Ice crystals congregate and form snowfall or snowflakes that get bigger and get heavy enough to actually fall as snow. The first point there, um, water freezing is something I want to dig into a little bit more because as it turns out, water doesn't really like to freeze. It's an endothermic process. It takes energy to make water freeze. And so that means water can exist in liquid form below freezing temperatures. You guys are all familiar with this, I'm sure. Lakes, frozen lakes have um, super cooled um, sub-freezing water below the, below the ice. The same thing happens in the clouds of winter storms. Water or water molecules can exist in liquid form at temperatures as low as negative 15 degrees Celsius. One way to speed the process of freezing and subsequent snowflake formation is to add a seeding agent or a nucleation agent. So that is, could be a number of things. There's dust particles and pollen, naturally occurring ones, uh, pollution and smog can contribute uh, coincidental nucleating agents, and then we can also have intentional seeding agents, and that's what we're talking about today with cloud seeding. Uh, typically use silver iodide as a cloud seeding agent. It's a very small molecule, and it's similar to water molecules, similar molecular structure, and it also has a similar polarity to water molecules, so it functions really well. And what it does is it makes, it speeds up that freezing process. It allows sites for water molecules to freeze onto and also allows the temperature at which freezing and snowflake formation can, it, it allows it, snow, snowflake formation to happen at a higher temperature than it might otherwise, basically. So what that looks like in operation is silver iodide can be added to winter, winter storms, winter clouds, either through planes or through ground-mounted generators. There are a few programs, or at least one program in Colorado that uses planes, ours won't. Ours will use ground-mounted generators, and they use, they burn propane to shoot silver iodide up into clouds. They rely on the orographic effect, so upslope conditions essentially, where the mountains cause the air to be pushed up high in the atmosphere, and they have that wind, that air um, helps the silver iodide mix up into the clouds really well and increase the snowfall that would otherwise not occur. This is a 
little example of a generator. Our generators will be mounted on trailers. But this is just shows kind of the, the basic elements. You see the propane tanks. It's silver iodide is mixed in with acetone, acetone rather, in the tank. And then there's a burner there. These generators are remotely operated, so there's cellular telemetry that allows them to be controlled from a desktop. A couple questions that, um, and talking about this, I have seen this come up over and over again. So we'll go through them one by one. The first one is, does cloud seeding really work? And it's a good question because with cloud seeding, you're adding these very small particles across a really wide range, you know, whole watershed in our case. And it's hard to tell how much additional snow actually fell because of that process. There are a lot of studies and the process has been used uh, in Colorado specifically since the 70s. So it's a commonly used process. There's a lot of work that has been done looking at basins that have been seeded, seeded versus basins that haven't been seeded and comparing the resulting snowpack and runoff from those two that indicate that cloud seeding can produce between five and 10, maybe even 12% additional runoff from, um, from the actual seeding drop a whole season. Um, there are, is now some, what, some radar images that show clouds that have been seeded actually having greater precipitation than clouds that have been seeded. So the technology is starting to catch up to show what many cloud seeding operators have known intuitively that the process does work. Um, it is still hard to measure exactly how much snow we are producing. That this next question, so if it does work, then are you taking water or snow from one area? Um, and you know, if, if a storm is coming through and you're pulling extra snow from it, would that snow have eventually fallen somewhere else? And are you essentially robbing Peter to pay Paul? Are you taking, in our case, maybe snow that might have fallen on the west slope of Colorado away from them? And the reality is the amount of precipitation that falls in a winter storm is only about 10% of the total moisture in the clouds. Cloud seeding increases snowfall by about 1% of that 10%, so, or 10% of that 10%, is so only 1% total. So there's still 89% of the moisture left in that cloud to produce snow downwind. So the, the thought is you are taking a little bit of water out of the clouds, but in the context of how much water is available, it's really a drop in the bucket. And then there's certainly some concern or some thought about, you know, this, the, the notion of adding a chemical into nature, uh, is it safe? And the, there's a couple, one, the, the chemical itself, the silver and iodide, um, when, it, when it enters into the, the environment, it denatures into elemental silver and iodine. Iodine is, you know, something that we use on our skin, it's naturally occurring in nature and it's relatively inert. Silver is also um, very inert. It doesn't really travel very far. Once it melts into the soil, it just um, it combines with the soil and is undetectable based on background soil levels, uh, silver levels in the soil. We've got a lot of silver in our area too. And so the, the concentrations that we are adding into the watershed are so, so tiny. If you consider dispersing about two pounds of silver iodide across the whole watershed. Um, it's, it's really a, the only way you can detect any quantitation, any, any measurable amounts of silver is in the freshly fallen snow with really advanced mass, mass spectrometers. So it's really hard to detect it right away. And then as soon as that snow melts, it's um, below the background levels that occur. So we're, at the district at least, are, are convinced that it is a safe process. And, we're also convinced that it works, and we're excited to see what we can make happen. Yes? What about the carbon footprint? That's burning. a great question. Burning okay. propane. Yes, so there is a carbon footprint associated with it. And uh, it, any, any idea of the scale? You know, it's like 25 vehicle miles traveled for a camera. I, for don't, a camera. I don't know <laughs> this, the details. Yeah, um, okay. They aren't super large. It's um, not a not a huge amount of propane that's needed throughout the year. And uh, one thing I should have mentioned with the, talking about the operations, 
we're only going to see winter storms that have the right conditions for us. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're going to be operating this cloud seeding all the time. It's only when there's the right storm coming through that we'll be turning the units on. And you know, storms will only last for less than a day or a day or something like that. So you're, so. you're like burning propane for a day in the clip. Like yeah. how many cubic feet of propane that is? Or you know, I don't know yet, to be honest okay. with you. Um, but that's a great question, and that's something I think would be helpful information for us to think about moving forward. Is there a way that we want to offset that carbon footprint somehow? Because just to be yeah. recognizing that we. I'm not the only person who's ever going to ask that question. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good thing to be considering for sure. And. Thank you for interrupting me. Please stop me with any other questions you guys have. I'm happy to um, answer them as we go. Yes? Um, so if this is kind of a long-term plan, and yes. maybe it's not detectable after one year, mm -hmm. at what point do we continue? Like, also a great question. So that notion of if we're doing this over 40 years, <clears throat> will this eventually accumulate in the environment to be detectable? And I don't know the answer to that exactly. Um, there have the this this map here shows programs that have been operating in Colorado. Many of these programs, I think the first program was started in Vail back in the 70s. Um, I don't know if they're starting to see, you know, over that course of 40, 50 years that they're starting to see any accumulation. Um, but that's something that I think we want to be thinking about looking forward and working to, to be taking good measurement data now and then compare it as we progress with the program. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, this, this map um, shows the programs in Colorado. There are seven permitted programs in Colorado. Um, ours is the eighth. You might notice from this map, all of the permits are on the west slope. So our program is the first one on the front range. There are between 100 and 200 different cloud seeding generators involved in all these programs. That's all those little green dots up there. So you can see they're scattered kind of throughout the states, but all on the west slope. Uh, we've been in conversation with the Colorado Water Conservation Board about starting a program in our area. And the size of our basin makes it a good candidate to, to pilot this program and to see kind of what the level of interest is and see what, um, what questions come up to see how effective we are at seeding um, clouds that are moving from the east to the west. So our program will consist of two remotely operated generators. You can see them located up there, and I'll zoom in on those two sites in a little bit. We're estimating with these two generators maybe a 1,000 to 4,000 acre foot increase in runoff. And we're contracting with the North American Weather Consultant Groups. They're based out of Salt Lake City. They operate the program in Gunnison, and I believe one over in the Grand Lake area as well. They've been seeding, they've been doing weather modification for many, many years. I believe they have like 40 years of experience. So those two sites, one is located on the St. Grand Supply Canal, so that's a northern water property just east of Lyons. It's the Lyons track track, Trash Track location, if you guys are familiar with that at all. And the other, uh, so super thankful to Northern as well as the Highland Ditch Company. They're allowing us to use their property at no cost. Uh, Highland Ditch Company, we're going to, is agreed to let us locate a generator at the Foothills Reservoir. These two locations are kind of right at the foothills, and we'll hopefully, um, the, the thought is that they, as they, as storms come from the east to the west, um, wind hits those mountains and really start, takes that, or the orographic effect really drives the, the winds up into the atmosphere, and so they'll, seeding at these two locations will allow for good dispersion of the silver iodide into the atmosphere. So these generators are only from storms that come from east to the west? Yeah, that's what we're targeting with this program. Is there any thought to put generators further to the west? So that, because I'm not a meteorologist, but those are those storms don't happen very frequently. Right? Yeah, exactly. So yes and yes. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go through a couple of example storms and I'll circle back. Um, so this is a, a model that simulates 
It was built to simulate a pollution distribution, but it can be used to simulate civil iodide distribution based on several storms. Um, and these are past storms, so you know each storm is going to be slightly unique. But these are the type of storms that we would look to see, and you can get a sense for what the distribution of the housing agent would be over the basin. And different storm conditions will lead to different, um, basically different areas where we will impact. And so that will determine what storms we choose to seed and what storms we don't choose to seed. This also is planting the seed for a future expansion of this program, looking at if we had generators located at different locations and you could capture, you could see certain areas depending on the storm. And if our target area is the St. Gray Basin, if we have generators located further to the north or further to the south, then we would have more opportunities to see the storms that would impact us. And with our existing generators, we'd also have the potential to see to other areas if there's other partners who are interested in joining us in the future. So I'll just click through. You can see some of the stronger winds can really make a, a very large impacted area. Um, the intensity of the impact might be smaller. It's kind of, I like these pictures at least. So. <laughs> but you can see, you know, this is probably a storm that we wouldn't see, but the from that location, the opportunity to see a, a large area is certainly present. Kind of a fun circular storm there. And some of these storms seed on the west side of the divide. And so there's talk about partnering with the existing program on the western side of the divide to share our generators. And to Jason's point, um, potentially installing generators closer to the divide that we could that both programs could use. So if storms are coming from west to east, we could benefit from them. If storms are coming from east to west, they could benefit from them. And so we could reduce our operating costs by sharing that same unit. So this is the type of storm that would have you know lots of impact all across the divide. So the timeline for this program, we just got our permit awarded on November 15th. And we are planning to install equipment next week and begin operations in summer. Once uh, operations complete in April, we'll get a report for how much was seeded, the storm that was seeded, and an expectation or an estimation of how much additional runoff was created and snowpack and runoff was created from, from the operations. Part of how that is calculated is using sites that are, so these are all the yellow dots, um, the, sorry, the yellow boxes up there are snowtail sites. And so there are control sites and there are target sites. This is an example from the Gunnison program. And the lettered sites are the control sites and the numbered sites up there are the target sites. So seeding operations happen around the, the target sites and storms that came through um, there was a snowfall from those storms was compared from the two locations basically to determine what the difference or the impact of the and the operations were. As you can imagine, this isn't the most perfect method, and it's kind of hard to do a controlled study when you want to see the entire basin because a storm is going to impact that basin potentially slightly differently than the basin next to it. Uh, one of the tools that I'm really excited about that I'll talk about a little bit later is the airborne snow observation flights. It's using light, plane mounted LIDAR to collect snowpack data. And there is potential to use data that's gonna be flown over the Northern Front Range to see, um, just to see if there's any difference that we can detect using that method from our area of interest versus adjacent areas as well. So the cost for this pipe program, uh, the operational costs are just under $50,000, and the district is contributing 43 of that. The left-hand ditch company is actually chipping in $6,000 of that, so we're really thankful to them. And then the CWCB is going to be purchasing the equipment, so they will be the owners of the generators, and that those costs are just under $90,000. So total costs are just under $140,000 for operating two generators. As we evaluate the program, if it works well and if there's opportunity to expand the generators, um, the number of generators in the future, then you know operation costs would likely increase moving forward. So we would certainly, 
invite the district, or sorry, the city, um, to consider joining us in this effort moving forward. Um, as you guys are putting your budget together, happy to have more detailed conversations about what we estimate that might look like. Um, but we could see full program build out at five generators total. So three located on this side of the divide and two located on the other divide, the other side of the divide, and then kind of correspond to operational costs. A big chunk of the operation costs are for the staff or a meteorologist to be evaluating storms. And so there is some economy of scale that um, as you add more generators, you're not necessarily costing uh, the operation costs on a certain increase at the same rate. And the permit area. So the permit is actually held by our consultant, North American Water Consultants. And when they applied for the permit, they decided to make it, um, to ask for the option to expand um, from Merrimack County all the way down to Teller County. And so there's actually quite a large area that this program could expand into. The target area is the same brain. And so we're gonna be starting with the same brain. But it allows us a lot of flexibility moving forward as we have conversations with folks throughout our basin as well as adjacent, adjacent basins. If there's interest in seeding north and south of us, we can do that with the existing permit that we have. We don't have to go get a new permit, which is um, something I'm really excited about. I'm really curious to see how this evolves moving forward and grows. Uh, I think Northern, Northern Water is certainly interested in what we're doing and we're curious to see what level of interest like the city board or other folks might have. As How well. long is that permit now? It's a five year permit. So we've got kind of five years to see what we can do, figure out how it works in our area, and then consider how we might want to expand it. And quickly to circle back to those airborne snow observatory flights. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this or not, if you've seen this, it's uh, a newer technology. It was developed in the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab and over the past maybe five or 10 years is spun off its own company to actually operationalize the technology. And it started to grow in interest over Colorado, um, throughout Colorado over the past uh, two to five years. So last year there was a large push and a large Colorado water plan grant through the Colorado Water Conservation Board to collect snow-free data over a large chunks of the state that didn't have snow-free data. So the way that this technology works is there's an initial flight that captures the ground elevation, and then you can, you can fly subsequent snow flights, so when there's snow on the ground, and then you can take the elevation of the snowpack and subtract it from the elevation of the terrain to determine the snow depth. And that is coupled with existing snow tail sites as well as snow courses that determine snow water equivalent from those flights. There's typically two flights that occur, one in April to kind of capture peak snowpack and one in May to capture runoff and especially like higher elevation snowpack and what's remaining. Um, there's some really, really cool case studies. Uh, Denver Water used this technology. They flew the Blue River Basin above Dillon Reservoir in a year that the snow tail sites were showing that there really wasn't a lot of snowpack left. Um, the airborne snow observation flights um, indicated that there was still a lot of snowpack remaining up high in the basin. And so they were allowed, they changed their operations. Instead of um, holding water back in Dillon, they were able to make additional releases to create room for the snow that was coming and were able to get a lot more efficiency out of their system that year. The converse is also true. There's been some some areas where the snow tail data is showing that there's still decent snowpack and then the flights show that there's actually a lot less snowpack remaining in the basin and so you know you can operate your system differently uh, projecting lower water supplies than you might think uh, one of the key things that this data provides is really that higher elevation snow data snow tail sites are typically ten thousand feet about and you know snowpack exists all the way up to fourteen thousand feet in some of our so it's we, we don't know a lot about how snow accumulates in some of those upper areas anecdotally we do but this provides a really high resolution it's 30 by 30 meter spatial um, distance and it gets like half centimeter vertical uh, accuracy so 
really um, high, highly precise data on a very discrete spatial scale. This project is also, the, the future funding of this, the state is looking, the, the Colorado Water, Water Conservation Board is looking at taking over the financial burden of this moving forward. The process that that might, the, the pace that that might happen at is maybe not fast enough to make sure that we are consistently getting the flights that we want. Um, the Northern Front Range, so that kind of, that light blue chunk up there on the map, um, from Clear Creek Basin all the way through the Pooter is being funded. The flights this year, this upcoming year, 2023 flights, um, really a cool story of folks all across the Northern Front Range, uh, Northern Water Conservancy District, um, Greeley, Fort Collins, Boulder, Golden, uh, Thornton, uh, Westminster, I think, uh, have all contributed funding for to make sure those flights happen. And that funding was leveraged against the WSRF grant through the South Platte Basin Roundtable to um, ensure that we can get our flights, our snow, snow on flights this year. So I'm really excited about that. Thinking now into 2024, uh, the Colorado Water Conservation Board looks like they're going to approve a larger water projects or project bill. I think is the right term. <laughs> um, but so they'll be they'll be um, adding more money towards this program, but it's not quite enough to cover all of the flight costs. So it's looking like in order to ensure that we have flights in 2024, 2024, we will only need to raise money locally again or figure out some other grant pathway. So another thing for the city to consider in their budget moving forward is, is this data something that might be of value and is there some contribution that might be able to make? Again, happy to talk through the details with you guys as we move forward. That's all I have for you today. Thank you very much for letting me come talk to you about this stuff and would ha be happy to answer any questions you might have. Scott, I've got one. If you're looking for partners, yes. funding partners, obviously the results of what you're doing would be important to them. Yes. So when do you anticipate some information coming out on how successful or not successful this program? That's a great question. So we are anticipating a report from the weather modification program in June timeframe. Um, I think we'll have some anecdotal sense of how often we see it and what storms were favorable or not, and kind of how long, and maybe some rough estimates from the from that from our consultant. But the final report won't be available until about June. Any other questions for Scott? Yeah, I have a question. Can yes. You hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, can, can you tell us a little bit more about the kind of remote generators? I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of like anticipating. You, you mentioned some combustible materials, you know, propane, propane, and things like that to be used. Are there open flames? Are there heat sources, for example? So, are you uh, at all concerned about operating those things remotely given the circumstances that we all find ourselves in of course these days with kind of the Louisville fire of course uh, freshly in our minds perhaps thank you that's a great question uh, i know that remote generators and even manual generators have been used extensively throughout the state i'm not aware of any issues with those but i do think that is really pertinent question and one I think the Marshall Fire has opened up all of our eyes to the, the really the, the damage that something going awry can cause and so certainly it's, I, I, I'm thinking the design of the generators that we'll have will be trailer mounted and so I think they're fairly contained so I don't anticipate anything being um, you know I think they're from what I understand, I'm, I'm curious to actually see, see the setup because I haven't seen the, the exact setup yet, but I'm, I'm thinking they're going to be pretty safe, but that's something that we'll be keeping an eye on for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, I, you know, as a humble suggestion, right, yeah. uh, just from a liability perspective, you, you may want to have a kind of a safe, safety management process in place whereby um, you at the very least have points of contact and, and, and some type of also remote system that, that monitors for any kind of fire, et cetera, you know, yeah. something that can away from you, uh, so that, you know, at least you've got to cross your T's and not your eyes. so. 
Thank you. I really appreciate that. Other questions? Scott, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Any, uh, thanks, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Yeah, you guys have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. Development activity, looks like there's nothing to report there, so let's get into general business. It looks like we've got a, what, a two minute presentation. If I had my way, it would be a one or two minute presentation. We're looking forward to But you can do it in two, right? We're looking forward to more than that. I can do my best. Show now. Sounds good. I just wanted, if I could in, uh, introduce it just real quickly. Um, one of the things uh, we've come before to talk about our update to our water efficiency master plan. Kind of the focus of what we're trying to do today is in the water board, in the council, draft council communication, we included the packet. Or some specific programs that we are hoping water board to take a quick look at. And, um, what we're really asking, um, we're not making any decisions today on what we will or won't have in our um, updated water efficiency master plan. It's really a process. We want the process to, to determine that um, as we go through it, including input from the public and boards and council and, and um, uh, pretty robust input process. But the, some of the specific programs, what we're asking for is, do you agree? We're proposing a few programs that we would, would expressly evaluate um, and come back with a recommendation. And so that's really what we're, we're asking today is, are you okay with us including that in the evaluation process? The decision whether to do it or not. Um, you know, one one example is the um, arterial landscaping. You know, that there's probably nothing in all the years I've been doing this <laughs> that I get more input on, and, and people see more, and, and it's what you see when you drive through town. Um, so that, and everybody has an opinion on <laughs> on that. So you know, do, do we want to study that or? or you know, and then come back with a recommendation. So Hope, Hope uh, is going to give you kind of a rundown of, of where we are right now with the update uh, and why and, and schedule and that kind of thing. So, well, let's take it. Thank you, Hope. Thank you. Uh, so we have, uh, we're on the schedule to meet at a council study session in December, on December 13th, where we'll present our council communication. So we wanted to get you all's feedback before we go to council um, so that we can have either your support and your comments um, on, the, on the five main projects or programs that we're proposing to study in our update. Um, so first and foremost, um, we would like to know if you approve in moving in the direction of creating more aggressive water conservation goals driven by climate change data. <coughs> so currently our, um, our goal is a 10% reduction of our 2048 projected build out demand. Um, we believe that we're already meeting this and that we meet this on average, and so we're proposing um, an increase in our goal, in our conservation goal. You mean a reduction in water usage? Has it increased? Yes. Increase in goal, reduction in usage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, um, so an example might be moving to a 15 to 20 percent um, reduction base for the study. May I ask you, um, the 10% 10, the 10 was reached over what period of time? Do you have any idea of from point A to point B that we got the 10%? How much yeah. time was that? I don't think we really have a, so the, the short answer is, is from when we set that goal in 2003 to today. Um, I'll say about a 20 year period. Um, we've in the past 20 years, we believe we've approximately met that 10% water conservation savings goal. 
So to put it in a numbers, our projected use for in 2048 is 35,000 acre feet at our projected demand build out use. We say that we should reduce that projected demand by 10% to be 3,500 acre feet, less than that. And we believe that we're already projected to not need that 3,500 acre feet. Is that right, Tim? Am I saying it the right way? That, that, that's exactly it. If, if, our, if our demand continues to build out, We've already realized. We've that already re realized that the lowered demand today we would have 3,500 acre feet more demand than had we not had a water conservation program. That's right. And that again is over a 20 year period. Yeah. 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 So that, <laughs> Go ahead. Just, the, the question would be so if you want another, let's say 5%, yeah. Yeah, but I would assume you'd look at a time period that uh, is coincident with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, are, you, are you looking at yeah. 5 over 10 years, 5 over 20 years, or you see what I'm asking? So five, 5 over, over build out of the city. Until 2048, which is that, mm -hmm. I know we're not supposed to say like what year we're. But that's what I bet you know Correct. the question I'm going to ask already, Ken, because I have nagged this before. <laughs> but um, we have made changes in the land use code and are contemplating more changes in the land use code, all of which um, yield greater population density than we had before, which in turn would lead a to a larger population um, over the years. So the population in 2048 is not the same as the, the projected population in uh, 2003. So my question is, did, did you change the population projections? So no, we've we've left our last future water demand evaluation was based upon Envision Longmont mm -hmm. and the build out uh, at about 120,000 population, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and the the 10 percent savings would, would do that. If, if we increase density, then obviously that will increase demand. But we so, have increased density already. We have, yes, from the 2003. At that time, it was the long month comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the but also from population was going to be 104,000. Yeah, so, so from 2016, we have additionally increased density. Yeah, and we have not. That that is not in our future water demand evaluation. Yeah. Okay. So question number two is, what does it take? Because the last time you and I talked about it, and the last time I talked to Harold about it, um, the answer I got was, I think we'll just take care of it. You don't need council to act. Does council need to act? Do you need explicit that explicit direction? to change the number, the, the projected, to, to do po different populations that build out? No, we, um, uh, we don't, we um, would need, we try to follow the comprehensive planning process. And, and to be honest, I, I know the planning department has told us they're in the process of uh, amending that. Um, and whatever that amends to them will come in and, and, and change that. Um, we also can look at almost any scenario. You know, we don't have to, we can give a scenario planning as well. Right, and, and, and that's my question because it seems to me that the planners need to be informed 
supply and anticipated water supply in terms of what they decide to do. So okay. we're getting some chicken and egg thing going on here that, that I would rather not have. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting questions. It is, yes. I, I, you know, just a thought to Marsha's point, I, I would, my thought would be that we would reach goals, some type of a goal based on per thousand people, per 10,000 people, you know, and then however the population goes, we have a number that we're driving towards, a usage number, and a, another 10,000 that we didn't expect let that drive it if you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm. um i understand what you're saying but it seems like a very uh douglas county parkery kind of a, an approach in the sense that that you're taking a pretty big risk of coming up short if you do it that way whereas you can um we can't control the population but we can control other things like permits issued yes. um, yeah uh, how much change we make to the land use code we may have to say stop um, uh, you know we may need to increase our capacity to buy water again um, so if if we if we had a target number that we're shooting for it just seems it, it seems like uh, you know which what how many controls we would need to uh, apply as opposed to letting letting the population swing freely and then do what are you saying you i'm not saying swing? freely i'm just saying you'll plan for a certain population yeah so we'll just use the word build out yeah and i think a lot of things were derived around a build out number mm -hmm. And to me, that's where I would come from, depending on where we target the build out. Other things would flow from that as far as water use or what have you. Well, but that's what I'm saying. We're already changing the build out target. It's just not being acknowledged in this process. Allison, jump in here if you have some great comments. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great comment, but um, maybe it'll help. Um, or not. Um, it seems to me like a lot of what we're discussing is like what are our definitions of conservation and when i look at this this water efficiency master plan it's called an efficiency master plan but has the subtitle of like conservation like program to me those are vastly different concepts mm -hmm. and i think that they have different implicit goals and so i guess i would suggest that we first before because I think it's relevant to what we're saying here is we figure out and come to a common understanding of what we mean in the first place before we try to come up with targets because while I think water conservation is great if water conservation is synonymous with efficiency as I understand it I'm not sure I'm super jazzed about that but my definition might be totally wildly different from your guys's so I guess I would suggest that we really find these terms before we start trying to come up with numbers and percentages we want to tack on to. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and, and just to reiterate, these are ideas that we're asking if we should study. Yes. So we're not saying like, hey, we're going to assign this. Do you guys approve? We're saying like, hey, we're going to ask our consultant that we hire to see if this makes sense. And they're going to work with our planning department and say, hey, what's up with the build out? Does this make sense? They're going to coordinate all of these things. But I do think that there's tremendous value in figuring out, defining those things. Totally. Thomas, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I have a, I have a question for Hope, actually. Um, so it's not so much a question, maybe just like a, um, uh, I just kind of want to point out like a little bit of a distinction, I guess. So, uh, I mean, from this point forward, I feel like we have a lot of opportunity to kind of manage water use in the growth that comes in the future, 
right? So, so, so that obviously we have a lot more kind of like holdover, you know, to, to be able to kind of, you know, manage that, that growth and the water use that comes from that growth um, using things like density and, and, you know, the sizes of yards and all that kind of stuff. The, the, the things that I guess I'm kind of seeing the opportunity within is the existing infrastructure. So, I mean, in your kind of list here, you've got things like um, leak detection and repair and, and those types of things. And I guess I'm just kind of curious about maybe your thoughts about kind of like that, that most of the opportunity in my, in my view, it seems like most of the opportunity to improve efficiency into the future actually comes with, from existing infrastructure relative to something that we build in the future. And so I wonder whether we already kind of have a little bit of like answer in a way in, in, our, in our hands because the things that we can improve the most already exist. And so whether the, the discussion about what the future holds is, is maybe not as important as what we can do to improve efficiency in the infrastructure that exists today. Sure, I see where you're coming from on this, and you might be jumping ahead a little bit on one of our different points. But one of the, the one of the main things that's really important for staff that we study is applying a growing water smart lens. And, and if you all remember, this is the seminar that we that Ken and I attended um, earlier this year, and basically it's just changing the way that we think about planning and developing our city with water efficiency. I'm going to use them interchangeably, but they're not, water efficiency lens in all new development. And so that would require us to be more involved in the planning de development, um, planning um, process, but also to make sure that the way that we move forward as a city is outlined sustainably. So along those lines, we're going to be proposing that we take a deeper dive into our code and our design standards and that we update our code and design standards so that all of our new development moving forward is water efficient. That being said, we want to get that in place first because we want to stop the bleeding, right? We want to fix the leak before we fix the water damage, right? So we want to make sure that we're developing efficiently. That's what we're going to be focused on, on what I'm proposing that we focus on in this study. Um, and then after that, then we can go back and look at our existing infrastructure. It's not an either or because our existing infrastructure is important. Obviously, if there's a leak, we fix it. But if we don't address our future development and if we don't develop efficiently, then we're always going to be retrofit, which is not effective. So it's more effective if, if we grow and focus on growing sustainably from the start, changing our codes and our design standards and our landscaping regulations, those types of things, before we do like our turf replacement, right? Because right now we have, and for instance, I live in a brand new development. Everyone in my neighborhood is carrying out our yards and we've been there less than two years. <coughs> that was stupid, right? Like we should not be putting in turf and now the city is paying to take out this turf. So, we're going to be focusing on kind of changing the way that we develop before we go back to our existing infrastructure. On the appendix, good that they're doing it. For sure, it's great. But it's also like silly. Like, why didn't we just do zero scaping in the front yards in the first place? Because we didn't have a hindsight. <laughs> right, right, yes. To play devil's advocate, and I agree with you. <laughs> You're right, stop the bleeding, right? I'd argue concurrency instead of linear, no track, and I know we don't have the resources to do it. Right, we don't have the yeah. human resources to focus on it. But I'll just point out that if we have well over 100,000 in population now, it's already developed, mm -hmm. it's already there. The delta of growing out over a period of 30 more years is relatively small Absolutely. compared to the existing savings we could, you know, come up with with retrofit, retrofitting existing infrastructure. Yeah, Boulder County learned this and drove the Basel Planning Commission because we went after new development. And somebody pointed out that, you know, trying to make all the new houses be more, you know, um, energy efficient, ignoring all the existing infrastructure that is completely energy inefficient, the scales heavily tip towards what's already there and it can be replaced sure. and retrofitted. Yeah. So, 
That's my devil's advocacy. Yes. I appreciate the... Yes, and just, we absolutely yeah. will not stop what we're doing now. And actually, we're we're jumping around a lot, but sure. that's okay. No, that's, um, that's, that's my next point. Yeah, that's my next point, is continuing and or increasing the benefits that we already offer um, and focusing more on our vulnerable communities. So um, we're not going to stop what we're already doing. In fact, we want to do more. But, and we learned this from the CWCD, so you might have heard that the um, they, they just got a bunch of funding to do to fund more turf replacement projects. And one of the people at CWCD said, I will fund in a heartbeat someone who has codes that's going to stop the landscaping before I fund a brand new program that doesn't have their ducks in a row. So if we don't have our ducks in a row, like eventually we're not we're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. If that makes sense. But Marsha, I think you have something. Oh, I always have something. <laughs> um, we need to we we need to get this corrected to the state legislature because a lot of the bleeding is in open in, in open space existing open space, not open space with capital letters, but non-dwelling spaces in homeowners associations. And they are yeah. just lousy with turf and we can't stop that. Yes. We talked about this before. Yes. That's a whole another bear. Yeah. But yeah. Um if you don't mind. <laughs> that was I'm already past my two five. minutes, huh? <laughs> one yeah, but we're all we're interested in what you're saying. And, yeah. and to be honest with you, back to where you started, I I need to fully understand what are you asking of us. Yes. And that's cloudy right now. But anyway, you yeah. press on. I'm asking no, this is good. We're asking for feedback. And we're asking for direction. So for you to say, no, I don't think you should increase your conservation goal. That's great. That's what we're asking for. Yes, I do think you should. Yes. Yeah. I love what you have in the packet. So I would support all of those goals. I would first use just the lawyer in me. I need to have definitions. Yes, I love that. Um, before I say yes or no, the way I read it, I found them very inspirational. That's my personal lens. My yeah. personal lens would be different than what someone else's. So I guess what I would request, especially when it comes to whatever engineer, modeler, whomever you're going to use, they're going to apply some sort of algorithm or model, scenario, whatever, to the answers they're going to give. But if they're not in alignment with what I view as conservation or efficiency or what I'll do, that answer is not going to mean a lot to me. Or it's going to tell me something that's not what I interpreted it as. So I guess my request would be, a lot of this I feel like is really, really inspiring, but I feel like a lot of it's insider jargon. Yeah, for sure. That I'd love to have broken down by the council to make sure that they're understanding these things that I'm writing. Well, the council doesn't know anything. That's <laughs> the thing. <laughs> but but uh, the fact that we started just discussion about the definition of two words that were in the same phrase it seems to me that um, in terms of putting requirements on the consultants, that what you'd like to do is define some metric points. So we just in this kind of unstructured discussion, we have talked about losses in the distribution system, leak detection and all that hoo-ha, um, and then um, delivery options, uh, uh, you know, stuff, losses like evaporation from lakes and golf courses and, and from the um, sprinkler systems coming on at the wrong time of the day and, you know, that, that kind of efficient use as opposed to efficient delivery. Mm -hmm. And then the conservation piece is in per capita consumption, mm -hmm. which we've been addressing for a long time by giving people more efficient toilets and shower heads and faucets and stuff. And that I think is probably, since we haven't addressed any of the other stuff, the earlier, the delivery and use metrics much yet, um, then, then the, um, uh, you know, the per capita consumption is what we've been doing a good job for as long as I've been paying any attention. Um, and before that, because I, you know, 
lived here for 10 years and, and gotten faucets in the mail, you know. Um, so you've been, you've, you've probably got a pretty high penetration of high efficiency fixtures inside homes. Um, and, and a lot of people used the, the tuning your sprinkler system uh, feature last summer and the summer before. So um, I, I can think, without even thinking about it, I can think of three tiers of metrics and we could, we could look for improvements at, at each tier. And then you need to figure out, depending on what target you expect to hit, how hard we have to work on it. Okay. Okay. You got that part. Uh, so we touched a little bit on point two. Well, I guess does anybody have any like closing? Okay. <laughs> um, So we're asking um, if you approve in moving in the direction of continuing and or increasing our benefits to vulnerable communities. So we currently offer several programs, um, efficiency <laughs> works and um, resource central. Um, we just started offering income qualified garden to box discounts through resource central. Um, and then our partnership with efficiency works is a bit more money, but we're, um, we're working on increasing those those benefits and removing <coughs> as much red tape as we can for, for our community members um, to have access to rebates and discounts on um, efficient projects and programs. Um, <coughs> efficiency. Why don't you describe vulnerable communities? <coughs> the vulnerable communities is, um, that I'm talking about is defined by our sustainability department, and they're working on, um, what is it called? Uh, it's, um, They're using, they're, they hired a consultant firm to, um, to identify the vulnerable parts of our community as far as most affected disproportionately by climate change. So heat, impact, um, income disparity, um, air quality. Um, so just members of our community that don't have access to the same benefits and resources that other members of our community do. So it could be anywhere between from um, income vulnerability <coughs> to like living in a place where there's no trees to... Oh, that was my point. It actually, I can understand vulnerable members, but when you say communities, it describes to me an area that you can focus on and I don't you know I'm not sure we I understand we do or do not have that so yeah so I'm they, struggling they with that yeah, we do have those so identified risk and vulnerability map thank you mm -hmm. okay. yes so um my question is I so I support that we continue to investigate that and to um, apply resources to that question mm -hmm. um, my, my comment is that I want to know how we are actively engaging with those communities mm -hmm. versus passively offering to those communities <laughs> those types of resources. Yeah, you Because we can make them available, but those communities may not be the most uh, informed or the, have the most access to information. And there's an active, there's an active element yeah. there. Yes. So, so the city does have a, a program for reaching out to all to they come community or individual. Well, we haven't identified yeah, the yet, but when we do identify them, now we need to get Once we've yeah. identified them, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, I can't remember the acronym. It's a SOL program. Oh, so yeah. I apologize for not remembering that. Sustainability group is heavily involved in that process. Yeah. Yeah. That's just my they, comment. They yeah. are reaching out directly. An example, we, in, we increased our garden in the box there's a certain uh, amount of uh, subsidy we apply for a garden in the box. First, the garden in the box is a very good deal. Right. Yeah, no, give it a point. Yeah. Um, 
but then we apply, apply a, a substitute to that to reduce that price even more. And, but then to the sole participants, to, to the, that program, we're, we don't have to do it through water conservation. Uh, that program we then um, gave free revenue boxes to. And they're able to, partly because what it does is then for the income of tribes, members of that community, if they convert to land, their landscape, they lower their water bill. So, so it really, really does help them. Um, and, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, sure, I get that too. But uh, so that program is, is really powerful. We identify and actually get that information to us. Yeah, I, I just make the comment because oftentimes I think um, that information isn't actively presented. It doesn't get yeah, it. It's just we're offering it. And gosh, why isn't anybody using it? You know, there's that disconnect, I think. Well, that's. Anticipate being helpful and what's actually helpful. Yeah, we actually are currently facing that. Um, and I, I'm working really closely with the sustainability team. So they're hiring someone to do a study on best practices to reach those communities because all of their programs are the same. But this will also, like, I really want our our update to be focusing on that, like, where and how do we reach these communities. It's very important. Um, I don't, I'm just remembering back and looking at just, just you and Mike. I love Gardener in the Box because it gives somebody a, the opportunity to change up their landscape, not just go like rocks down or asphalt or just not aesthetic, but it's also terrible. <laughs> but what about trees? Like we've got Gardener in the Box, so like trees in a bucket. Mm-hmm. Like is there a program where we can bring that aspect to communities and it's something that, you know? So yes, yes, yes. there is, and I'm not sure how well that's promoted too. And, um, uh, I get the idea that there's this little cabal of people who know about it and they're dialing at midnight the day it opens and yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> how did you know that? <laughs> Word of mouth. No, I mean the the lack of communication to our community members, I would say is a citywide issue. It's not just my programs that people don't know about. Um, so we'll definitely work on that. There's a tree in the bucket. There's a there? tree, it's yeah. an Arbor Day sale and you get a large tree for forty dollars. It's very it's amazing. amazing. But yeah, I mean, I yeah, no, I I stay up until the night so I can get a tree every year. What if we, when we get our map, we include some sort of like a coupon in like locations we identify, so like mm-hmm. really, be like literally, it's a coupon. People can send an email to Lisa. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Listen, Lisa Nobla, the sustainability coordinator. Can I have a comment, if that's okay? Mm-hmm. Sorry, Tom. Um, no, that's okay. Um, uh, I, I'm hearing a little bit of kind of discussion about um, the, the way that it's kind of framed is, hey, we have this program. How do we advertise this program to vulnerable communities? And I, I just want to make sure that we also kind of shift that around just a little bit, which is uh, kind of more of a near vulnerable communities, what programs uh, do you want? Absolutely. And what what, what programs would best um, allow you to, to to meet the goals that we're trying to do with the programs that we provide, right? To mm-hmm. kind of like lower your water bill or, or those types of things that we really have, you know, some amount of purview over. So, um, you know, just again, kind of flipping that mindset around a little bit to make sure that we're not just figuring out ways to connect to them, but actually listen from them. Yeah. What they want. <clears throat> Absolutely. And and again, these are just things that we're proposing that we study. The big part of what our update process is going to be is engaging with the community and making sure that we're doing what they ask of us. And if they say, your programs are crap, we don't want them, we would actually rather you do this, then we'll do that. <laughs> but this is like part of what we're going to be engaging our, our public and our community members on. Anybody else? Are we moving on to three? Yeah. Okay. Moving on to three. Um, and it's a little bit of what we talked about before. Um, 
creating sustainable and equitable landscapes through updating our city code language and design standards, creating arterial right-of-way and residential community and commercial pre-approved landscape designs, and updating our parks and public spaces standards. Um, this is again just reiterating that we don't uh, want to just encourage. So right now our code language encourages low water, water wise landscaping. We're going to prioritize and or enforce low water landscaping designs in new development and redevelopment of spaces. And so for folks who want to tear out their yards, we already have the language in our code that says like you can't have just rock and you can't have just mulch. That has to be X percentage of living materials. And so this will go a step further, define what our low water use plants are, define what um, our pre-approved sort of, you know, obviously folks can do most of the time what they want to do, but giving examples, right? Because what we find, what I find daily is that people don't know. And so if we have examples, and I included some examples in, um, in the packet, if we have examples that say like, hey, new developments, hey, Costco that's putting in turf right now, please don't do that. Here's a streetscape for you that we love as a city. And then they say, okay, cool, and they're gonna do it. Because we hear from developers that that's a common thing, that they're saying, we'll just do what you ask, but if we're not asking them to do anything, they're gonna turf. So, do you all support us studying the, in the creation of those designs, um, doing a, a code um, audit, studying our code, figuring out the best language of code updates, um, comparing ourselves to other communities surrounding us. Anybody disagree? Tommy, do you remember that? I don't have any problem. So have, yes. Yes. Can we add maintenance to that? Because there's nothing worse than like maintenance guidelines. Yeah. For, it's like putting in something brand new and then having nobody take care of it, so it's completely useless after. And then everybody's like, "Oh, I hate how they put in serious maintenance." Like, Whoa. That's because you can't use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I agree. The installation is the easy part. People, some people don't like it. Not because it's not good. Not because it didn't look good on one end, but on one side. Yeah. Or are you like, <laughs> um, well, it takes three years to get it to look good in the first place. That's right. Another thing that's not included in this, but just to, to let you all know that we're thinking about this, is implementing some sort of, I don't want to say contractual obligation because that sounds really harsh, but like if people tear out their turf and put in a wonderful xeriscape garden and then 10 years later someone buys their home, where, where, how are we gonna not let them put grass back in? So there's lots of communities who are doing something like this. I hesitate on going in the direction of Aurora. I feel like that's not where we're at, but some sort of like conservation easement or like deed something, I don't know. What did Aurora do? Well, Aurora is just saying no, no front lawns ever. Castle Rock's doing the same thing. Castle Rock's doing the same thing. Our body's looking at it. So what, what, what are you proposing? Is it, I'm proposing we hire someone to study what we should do. <laughs> so know. that we that. don't let people put grass back in after they've ripped up. Strong encouragement to... So we have launched a turf by that yeah. program. Uh, we are asking or suggesting that we Put a little more thought and vet that program. Um, and, and one option would be some type of a conservation. So deed restriction. Deed restriction. Yes, thank you. Yeah. It doesn't go back to grass. Sure. And, and there's a lot of issues. You know, yeah. how, how much do we do in turf? By that count, you know. There's a lot. Of, I, I see that as a program that we just want to have a well thought out of what Oregon Council and the community that research it for us. Well, we, it's, it's out there. I was just wondering how much we talked with Boulder County. They had their, about a decade ago, their program by which they were trying to entice existing owners of 
real property to um, create a more green energy friendly um, environment in the house. And as a way to do that, they were going to um, pay that over, basically bake it into your mortgage. Mm -hmm. So it would be an investment from the county into the county into the community, but the obligation would go with the house. So if you sold it, the obligation to keep that is still with the house. Right. When they I was looking took it away at, as I was in line to get that because they thought they don't fall legally. I suspect what that I can't remember what that was, but that'd be a worthy conversation for the city to have with the county because they've already gone down that path really far. In fact, granted the first round of financing for that, and then the second round they said, "Yeah, you know, we need to pull back." Yeah. So I don't know. The, I can't remember what it was. I just remember being in line going, "Darn it! <laughs> Here's my drafty house that could have got energy, you know, improved, but." Um, yeah. There was a fatal flaw. And the conservation easement language came actually from a Boulder County document that I was looking at, where pe they were granting that for folks to not change their landscape or something like that. I'm not sure about the landscape. Boulder County certainly went down that path with the size of houses okay. and de restricting the ability to increase the size of it yeah. and creating conservation credits that could be transferred to other properties. So if you were looking for something, you could buy something from somebody that made it smaller. Net, net zero it out, mm -hmm. but I don't know about the landscape in Boulder County. Okay. But the energy out is pretty interesting because I think that's more similar to what you're talking about because it's a cost that the city's investing into a personal residence that needs to be protected over time. That's perfect. That's as far as I'm going. That's the perfect way to word it, right? Sure. Is because that's what's that's exactly what's happening. Okay. And, and really, it comes down, in my opinion, is not practicing attorney at the moment. Um, is that whoever acquires the property in the future has to have some notice that there is a restriction on it, otherwise, <coughs> I think that's my ability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any last? Like it's voluntary or if it's some way they can. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that was case nine, I can tell. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good time. Sorry. That's okay. Get in the weeds there. Any other last things? Comments? Okay, looks good. Um, Did you get what you wanted or needed? Yes. Yes. Thumbs up. I'm so good. Waterboard says go ahead. <laughs> um, we talked slightly about this a little bit, but um, increasing our education and outreach and implementing practices to make the city of Longmont an example of water efficiency for our community members and other communities. This is just like you said, lots of jargon. Really, what I'm what I'm asking is, do you approve increasing and making our education and outreach programs more robust? Doing more studies, figuring out what the what the public wants and how they want it, education and outreach wise, um, and then because of that, we'll get these outcomes of a healthier watershed because we'll increase education and outreach about watershed health um, and then <clears throat> we'll become an example of water efficiency for other communities and our community members is there a budgetary issue with that no i just uh, no. <laughs> what i want our consultant to this is mostly this is all kind of like building upon our application for our consultant to come in and i'm I'm gonna say this is what we want. Let's figure out how to make this happen because I'm just one person, and like I mentioned, I mean our our citywide communication is not well received. I mean, I work for the city, and that's the only reason that I know about half the programs that we that we do. So I think it's a citywide problem of, that we don't know how to reach our constituents. I'd be careful with wording because I, I doubt if there's a whole lot of congruence between what the public wants and what the organization needs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if your water bills were low, you would, and we didn't anticipate run, hitting a wall in terms of supply, everyone would want brass because it's the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, just ask the question a different way. Um, and then the last one, number five, plays off again um, with 
it goes hand in hand with number three of just kind of updating our codes and design standards. And basically it's just implementing that grow and water smart lens to our city development processes. Um, it's, it's basically focusing on the integration of water and land use planning, making sure that water resources is more involved in our city development um, and that we're working collaboratively from the start. Okay. Sorry, it took so long again. Well, it's not your fault. It's pretty easy subject. <laughs> this is you know, because I mean, we really care and we're so excited. And if I could just take this chance to tell you guys that Hope presents us with St. Green Latin Work and Services District. It's such an amazing job. You missed it. I missed it. But I'm here to tell you, she did a great job. Thanks. She made a lot more progress. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so that's all I have for the council communication. And then lastly, there's, I'm just coming with a, um, a draft letter of support. Um, and there's more information about this project um, for the, um, I'm writing down the words of this, that was like, you guys kind of drove them a little bit, but in a good way. <laughs> um, for the Native Grass Species Design Annual website. So this is a project that's being, um, led by Colorado Springs Utilities. Um, and basically it's um, creating a best management practices guide resource for people who want to do large commercial property turf transitions um, because it doesn't currently exist. And so this, we're just asking for um, you all to sign off on a letter of support for their CWCB grant um, to create a website for all of these documents and resources that multiple members of the city is working on. So you want this? Yes. I would move that we sign on to the Second. I'll second that. All right, move and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thanks for caring for your feedback. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, Ken, when did you have for any progress updates? Yeah, I think um, don't have a whole lot to update on other than the construction is continuing, going, going well. Um, they're, you know, they're at the point, I think we discussed last month, they're at the point where they're just, just last month, and just started like a few days before um, the, the, actually starting the day I'm going up. And, starting the hydraulic asphalt, asphalt core. They're now at a point where they're going between nine, nine inches and 12 inches a day. And so that's really good. Of course, they're down at the bottom and it's not too wide. As they go up, it gets wider and wider. Uh, so it'll slow down a little bit, obviously, as you go up. But um, it, it uh, is going well and uh, we're, I'm hoping for lots of snow for a snowpack, and I'm hoping for good construction weather <laughs> up on the project. So you'll, I'm a little uh, torn there. <laughs> uh, but um, no, uh, things are going well. Yeah, so it's good. I was going to say, I got sent to me on Sunday or Saturday the Jimmy Haller Reservoir Project Update video that was going to be used for the 2022 Fall Symposium. It's a YouTube video. It was really good. 20 minutes long. I almost show. I almost yeah. was going to show up today, but it was, yeah. it was just like, yeah, yeah, it's 20 minutes. So. But it is. Bring it back to it. Um, send a link around, Ken, if you got a link. I, I might just send yeah. a link. It's on the it's on the Jimmy Hall Project website. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I'll send that link because it's really, really well worth watching. I'll do that. Thanks. Any questions for Ken? Okay. Um, Jim, you're up. Okay. Jason, are you down there? Yes, Mr. Chair. You ready? I'll keep mine under two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> Don't embarrass her. Somebody put some duct tape on my mouth. I know. <laughs> uh, just got a couple quick updates. We're, we're wrapping up a couple projects. The South Sea Grain Pipeline, I think I mentioned last time we were closing that project out. It's, it's now complete, uh, with the exception that the pumps are still vibrating, but that's a, an issue. We'll work with the pump manufacturer. Um, 
it's nothing that I don't think we can't fix. We're going to put some additional supports in there for the pipes and everything uh, to brace that to try to minimize the, the vibration. Um, their engineering team's working on solutions. So um, other than just delaying our ability to use the pump station, the project itself, it itself is, is really complete. So, um, and that went really smooth and uh, uh, everything's looking really good. And I think I did mention last time, but it's worth repeating that we did make uh, deliveries to Nelson Flanders using um, the pump station. We, we did about 1.3 million gallons. 1.3 million gallons, which I know is a drop in the bucket, but it is it is our first delivery in quite in not quite two decades. What, 16 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's been a while. So, um, so anyway, so that's good. And then um, uh, earlier today, uh, I was up at Bud Rock uh, putting the last uh, um, fixing the last few leaks of the uh, uh, the outlet gate repairs and stuff. So we had uh, some. Uh, some hydraulic leaks and stuff like that. So anyway, um, that project was now um, complete. Uh, uh, everything's going good there. Um, we were leaking around the gate uh, down at the bronze seat. The bronze seat's the piece of bronze that when the gate actually closes, it closes on a piece of bronze. And that was the original component. They'd been using Balzona, which is a coating and everything to try to get the seal um, so in a way, it's, it's something that we weren't able to fix last time when we did the overhaul of the gate. So we went in, ripped out the old one, put in a new one that's now serviceable, and anyway, that's complete. And today's little touch-up was simply just to kind of put that project to bed. So anyway, it's up and going, and we can now make any additional releases. Wes, it's pretty boring up there at 17 CFS. where Everything's going through the bypass, so everyone's like, when are we going to use it? I'm like, I don't know, it might be springtime, but anyway. That's that's really all we got um, from an engineering standpoint. We'll Good move job. on to the next project. Good job, Richard. Yeah, that was impressive. <laughs> Any questions for Jason? <laughs> well, thanks, Jason. Okay. Review of major projects listing. Anything? Any comments about future board meetings on major project listing? Anyone? Um, my only comment would be we, we've listed some of the uh, larger, the A through F, E on the bottom, we've listed some of the larger projects you boarded asked and when we have opportunities and it's a little bit shorter agendas we can bring some of these forward so um, if there are additional major you know, subject areas you would like to have special presentations just let us know, we would be happy to know, One thing came up when we were interviewing our candidates about Project that's going up near Sunset Pool. That oh yes, you know okay. I think it would be interesting for us to get an overview of. of I mean that is a major, major construction project. I think it'd be good for us to get a little information on that. If you wouldn't mind working that in somehow, we will. I don't know who's in charge of that. They well, asked if Jason was, but the answer was no. He isn't. It, it's not, but I'll work with Jason. No, I think it'd be informative. Sure. So it is. Yeah. That's it. Plus the most visceral symbol of water in the Long Island area, right? Because it lifts up the hill as the water. You can see it from everywhere the water. Yeah. That's the water system. You know, it's, it's not just pumps down in Union or up in uh, the hills. But. Taking down that whole building structure, yeah. I live right north of there. <clears throat> now when the train goes through, none of the noise is blocked by that building. So I can, I can hear wheels clanking and everything. I could never hear that before. So anyway, I don't know if that's a benefit or what, but it's, it was interesting. I thought maybe not the thing to think about. <laughs> okay, uh, informational items. Any uh, items scheduling? We talked about cash and lose coming in March. And December. oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any uh, any discussion of future water board agenda items? All right. Well, I think we have concluded. Uh, John, thanks for attending the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, John. And uh, hope everybody has a happy Thanksgiving. And with that, mm -hmm. we're here. Thank you, Thank you for your long.